Okay, so this is MOSFETs. We all know a bit about MOSFETs. They work by like a switch or an amplifier. Uh, we've got a gate on the top. When you put an electric field, it allows the current to flow from the source to the drain. This is what it looks like on the symbol. And here we've got the graph. So as the, the gate voltage increases, we see this exponential current rise here. Most manufactured object ever made, 1.3 times 10 to the 22. Incredible. Okay, how do we change slides? So this is how you turn it into a actual useful tool, an inverter. That's the symbol. Zero goes in, one goes out. Here's the NMOS here. It's pulled up, so if it's off, no voltage. The voltage pulls it up, the resistor pulls it up, the output is one, zero, one. We turn it on, it pulls this down to zero, so now the input is one, the output is zero. But the problem with that is, you see here, as the gate turns on, we get this current rise here. So we're wasting current all the time. CMOS inverter has entered the chat. So we deal with that by having another type of MOSFET, a P-MOSFET on the top, complementary MOSFET. So it instead of the resistor. So this one is on or the other is off. And that means our computers can run cooler and faster. So enter the chat, silly whiz. In two minutes, let's go. Let's draw a CMOS inverter. <laughs> one minute 40, fuck. OK, <laughs> draw the substrate. Draw the N well. Draw the metal. OK, that's where we supply the power, power and ground, OK. This is going to be VDD, <laughs> VSS. And now we need to have a, a P MOSFET at the top, P diffusion, N diffusion. Talk to me later about lithography. Uh, polysilicon, OK, here come the gates. All right. Here, and here's the cross section. So at the moment, we've got the gate. We've got a self-aligned gate, because we're fantastic. And we've got the, uh, the power supply for the PMOS, the power supply for the NMOS. Still no DRC errors. Oh, baby. There's the output. Here comes the input. And now we need a via. Where are the vias? Down here. So let's draw. Via. 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 Oh, fuck. Oh, oh, shit. <laughs> DRC. Ignore the DRC. We're not going to make it. OK. In. Out. <laughs> okay, there's the connection. Switch to the simulation view. Oh no, something's gone wrong. Ah, oh, fuck it. Maybe this isn't connected down here. Oh uh, no. Can we do it? Oh look, it's there. We need the. Uh, we need more. New, we need no end vision. Yeah. Ah, oh, fuck. It. Here's one I drew earlier. Nice, thank you very much. All right, ready, set, go. All right, hi, I'm Nathan. Uh, that's me, same face. Uh, two weeks ago, I moved from the US to Eastern Netherlands to work at Cubay Logic, which is an ASIC FPGA company, I'm sure you're familiar, uh, which will be relevant. Um, another thing I'm interested in is the visual display of gra er, the visual display of information. So what we have here is a nice little topology. But what's interesting is we have uh, in a two-dimensional image uh, three dimensions represented of information. Uh, the third being the color to map, and it's a nice mapping uh, from this image into a mental model. This is not a new idea. Um, here's an example of from the 1800s of Napoleon invading Russia. Um, so here you see Napoleon running through Russia, and then right here, winter sets in, and you can see his army dwindle over time, comes back, and specifically on the retreat, you can see the temperatures in Russia dropping. Uh, very famous image. And so I was inspired, uh, I was studying operating systems at the time, and I took a operating systems chapter and tried to visually represent it. Uh, there's a lot of text there, but uh, one thing I tried to do is use things like visual hierarchy, colors, um, and relationships to encode information in the image itself. Um, if you're a programming language nerd like me, you might say we're doing a lot of type level information, where the types here in a visual image are just the visual motifs, so color, size, relationships. Um, so I want to talk about zines, which are short for magazines. Basically, you take uh, 
one paper, you fold it up, and then you populate it with information. And they were popular, they started in the 1940s uh, for labor movements um, as a way of distributing information, and they've sort of become their own uh, art form and uh, way of conveying information. Um, so my sort of central thesis of this talk is if you take information graphics and you uh, put them in zines, uh, you create an approachable way for authors to experiment with conveying information and you create an approachable on-ramp for uh, users to consume that information. Uh, this is not a new idea. Uh, Julia Evans has some really good uh, zines online about using like P-Trace uh, operating systems and um, understanding like the network stack. Uh, so I call this the uh, documentation rainbow of happiness because on the one hand this is a man page. It's very technical, it's very uh, full of information and in depth. But on the other hand you have the XKCD which is, um, you know, also contains information. Uh, so basically I made a zine for Clash which is our Haskell to Verilog compiler. I have it. You can take a look at it. Thank you. Oh, shitty shit. Oh, it's very small, yeah. Ready, set, go. Thank you. So, uh, I'll talk about Ethernet in three minutes using Spade. So, I have this Raspberry Pi camera. I want to connect it to my FPGA and then connect that through Ethernet to the, a, a laptop. Um, so, I won't go into the camera, but we have a camera feed that's some data. And as someone said, I'm a software developer, so I have the patience of a small ferret. So, I find an into Ethernet bytes method in my documentation and I try calling it, and I get, yeah, that doesn't work. So it says that option does not have a method into Ethernet bytes, but there is such a method for the ready valid types. What this is saying is the camera is shoving data at whatever rate it pleases, and Ethernet also wants to shove data at whatever rate it pleases. So we need a FIFO in the middle. So 1024 should work, probably. Uh, and we also ha we have camera data that is like a stream. We want to packetize it, so we'll packetize it. This is something you actually have to write outside of this. Everything else is libraries. But if you write your packetized method, maybe you can call into Ethernet packets. No. Uh, so now you get the error, pixel packets does not have a method called into Ethernet bytes. But it, there is such a method for the RV types of, uh, of IP packets. So we need to turn things into IP packets. What does that mean? Well, networking class, we have the application layer inside the, or you take the application layer, you make that the payload of the UDP layer, you take the UDP layer, you make that the payload of the IP layer, and then you the, the same thing, you get the Ethernet layer, and finally you can turn that into bytes. So uh, if we do that, we run into UDP, get the destination port and the source port, or specify those. We run into IP, specify source and IP address, uh, source and destination IP address, and same thing with the Ethernet port. And then we synthesize this, we realize that this is not meeting timing. So we will need to put in a few buffers here. We can just do that with some buffer methods. And now we actually have a working Ethernet thing that runs pretty much without any, or it has a tiny bit of latency, uh, but it's very fast. Um, if you're wondering what's behind these method calls, so this thing, for example, uh, calling into UDP, that gets compiled down to something like this where we instantiate the into UDP component. We specify a bunch of stuff for the ready signal and the valid signal as separate signals. This is a mess. There's no in useful information here that is not in here. The whole thing fits, looks like this in Verilog. It doesn't fit on the slide, so let's make it smaller. Smaller, smaller. <laughs> and there we go, now it fits on the slide. Um, so that still works. Uh, this is what it looks like behind the scenes. It's RTL. This, there's no magic here, you have full control if you know what you're doing. Um, yep. Oh, and here you can learn more. If you want exciting spadefish stickers, I have stickers.
Next one is Todd. Yep. All right, my name's Todd. Um, I'm with HRT. I've been contributing to Verilator for a while. I'm going to speak briefly about uh, debugging Verilator with RR. So uh, we've all been here. Tool crashes are real. Uh, at least Verilator apologizes. Uh, it tries to convince you to use GDB, but I'm going to suggest a, a different way. So if you find yourself in this situation, you can go down the uh, rabbit hole and uh, create a unit test for Verilator. Uh, here we've done a, a, found a different problem, and um, we can reproduce it. That's great. You can use uh, some flags to the, the unit test suite to ask for more information. It's going to give you a whole lot of, this is just a snippet, but um, you can see a bunch of hex values here. Uh, the hex values are pointers to um, syntax tree nodes in Verilator. Um, the problem with using GDB is every time you run this, uh, the allocation is going to be different. So you're going to keep looking at this information. It's going to keep changing out from under you. Uh, this is where RR comes in. It's the, recor the record and replay debugger. It's going to write down all sources of non-determinism, including system calls like uh, memory allocation. And um, you can use RR natively with uh, Verilator and the uh, unit test suite. Um, so here we're using uh, RR replay. Uh, and we can run this, and you can see the, um, the pointers are the same from run to run. Uh, I can run this 100 times. You can run this next Thursday. They'll all be the same. Um, further example, uh, Verilator likes to kick out syntax tree uh, files, human readable files. Uh, pointers, still the same. Every time you run it, uh, pointers are not going to change. Uh, one more uh, trick it has up its sleeves. Um, so we can run this thing to completion, catch the exception. Uh, with a little bit of grepping, we can find the errors coming from frame 9. So uh, let's jump to frame 9 and see what's going on there. So uh, there's an assert there. Um, it's looking for this pointer to be uh, null. It is not null, so we can set a hardware watch point on the location of memory and get the uh, processor involved. And then uh, using RR, you can run this uh, backwards in time and uh, see that uh, the set op 2 p method is what uh, changes it from uh, 0 to uh, this 9801 value. Uh, new and old are a little bit reversed, but that's okay because uh, time travel is a little confusing. Uh, and then, yeah, you can backtrace from there and uh, figure out what's going on. So, um, yeah. Uh, very later, RR, check them out, uh, use them together, use them separately, and uh, there you go. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, a little bit of software to the hardware world. Uh, I do CI setup for multi-platform software project. This project is Pixman, which I mentioned already in my uh, presentation. It has a lot of backends, so like MMX, SSE, like Neon, and some like Archeo stuff as well. Uh, and the existing CI setup was basically testing whatever was on the runner, which was x86, so it was no good for such application. And the plan was to execute all the tests for all the platforms, for all the backends, and preferably with uh, GCC and LLVM uh, toolchains. Uh, so there are two targets, code coverage targets and platform coverage targets. Code coverage, like would, we would like to have a sort of overview which uh, targets are, which uh, backends are tested and in which amount. And also for the targets that are not supported by uh, Debian in this case, uh, we want to run sort of uh, simple uh, platform coverage to see if it works and if it fails then yeah, uh, we'll see about that. So here's the result. Uh, so basically each platform has its own Docker image. It's either native uh, Debian image or it's uh, basically x86 uh, uh, with uh, cross compiler and stuff. Uh, and uh, we found out that uh, some targets fail. For example, for LLVM, build fails for uh, MIPS. Uh, and we have some test fails for LLVM. Interestingly, uh, i386 uh, fails all LLVM tests, also some like ARM, V6, PowerPC, Longs and MMI. I don't know if you know it, I didn't uh, at the point. Uh, also some platform fails, so some big Endian MIPS, P PowerPC, PowerPC64, and uh, some interesting uh, thing which I experimented with, running uh, cross-compiler on Windows on ARM. So there seems to be window, uh, Wine64 for ARM, and it works better than, uh, for example, i386 uh, uh, Linux. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's more or less it. Uh, the entire pipeline is really like, it's 100 jobs 
testing and building all the stuff. Uh, you can look the la rec recent pipeline ran, uh, run on the QR codes. And yeah, uh, questions will be uh, when I go back. So I guess, uh, yeah, it's, it's good, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. variation on a theme again in three minutes uh, I'm mostly going to explain Clash so Clash is based on Haskell of course everybody loves this language I, I definitely do uh, why is uh, why is Haskell good for hardware we can separate uh, things that happen in IO at the type level so things that happen in IO all side effects you can see it at a type level anything that doesn't have IO uh, as you see on the green uh, on the left it is translatable to hardware so what's Clash? Clash is an open source tool to convert the general purpose hardware, uh, general purpose language Haskell to circuits, either it means Verilog or VHDL. Um, also, all native Haskell features are available to uh, use in your circuit uh, descriptions. You can case statements, if statements, everything. So let's say uh, I want to select either foo or bar. You know, uh, this is some pseudocode or code that you might have in your language. If you look at most EDSLs, then if you write this, then you would either get the circuit for foo or you get the circuit for bar. However, in Clash, if you use uh, Haskell's native choice construct, you get the thing that you might have probably wanted, which is just a multiplexer that sets, selects between foo and bar at runtime. So to give an example here, uh, this is some Haskell code. I define some uh, some opcodes for my ALU, add, subtract, multiply. Then I have here my type signature, and I can use Haskell's regular case statements. So I have three arguments, the operand, operation I want to perform, and the two operands A and B. I select between the operations, add, subtract, or multiply. And when I do add, I do an addition of those operands, etc., etc., and that would translate to the circuit diagram that you see on the left. I'm not going to explain sequential circuits because I don't have enough time. Uh, what's really cool is that well, we get uh, we get all of Haskell for building the circuits, but we also get all of Haskell and all of its testing frameworks to test our circuits. Uh, we have property-based testing, which also does mean we get automated counterexample generation. So we do constraint random testing. You might get a failure 500 cycles in, but then it automatically tries to fold it back and maybe, you know, for you, find the counterexample that fails after five cycles, which makes debug a lot easier. Uh, since Haskell is a general purpose uh, program language, it has a foreign function interface, which we use actually to then interface uh, with Verilog. So we can either go through Verilator uh, compile Verilog to C++, then link it back into Haskell and just compile against it natively, or simulate uh, through VPI. So in conclusion, static compilation allows Haskell to use native constructs for all Haskell features. Thank you. The next one is our master of filming. There's mention of open risk at the yeah, open risk conference. <laughs> That's great, because I, I should only need two minutes. I'm not drawing an inverter. <laughs> yep. Right, hi. For those that don't know me, I'm Simon. When I'm not the person behind the camera doing filming at Orconf, I work at Embercosm. You may have heard of us because we do compilers. Uh, mostly open risk and risk 5 compilers and I spend a lot of time building a lot of compilers a website once a week takes the top of tree of GCC and LLVM and builds risk 5 tool chains open risk tool chains and when I say a lot of tool chains I mean there was a release of GCC and LLVM at the same time and let's just say the two machines under my desk were very unhappy with me um, the reason I'm mostly talking is because I just stick these tool chains out on the internet and apparently people use them. Um, for instance, when the RP2350 
was announced a couple of months ago, I was like, hey, I wonder how the boot run works. And there's just a random reference to one of my compilers in there. Um, I should work on SEO, because if you actually Google that string, Google says there are zero results in, except for this page. So clearly some work there. But it got me thinking, if people are using these tool chains, are they any good? Does people have any feedback? So this is as a, as sort of an open call for anybody who's using RISC-V or OpenRISC GCC or LLVM. Tell me what works, what sucks. Do you wish you had binaries that ran natively on AH64 or RISC-V? Um, we mostly use Nulib. Does Plibc of interest pe to people these days? Does ZYX extension, because that would be a standard one, not XYZ? Um, does the compiler break? Is no, really, the compiler's definitely wrong. Tell me why we've done something wrong. Well, the, the community at large has done something wrong. Or anything interesting, other interesting you're doing with the tools. Basically, any feedback at all. Because, as I say, I throw these on the internet, and yeah, apparently people are using them. So, uh, any uh, feedback at all, throw them at this email, toolchains.mbacosm.com. I can't guarantee that I will respond to all of your emails, but I can guarantee I'll read them. So, uh, be nice. <laughs> uh, thank you. Next one, Francisco. Okay. So, I basically come here about mostly from the security world instead of a really cool silicon design world. I came here out of curiosity and I heard, yeah, you can give a line talk. So, I tried to give a talk about what I know, which is security. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about side channels. A really quick question. Who of you has ever heard of Spectre? Yeah, exactly. So now you know what I'm going to talk about. So what is a fucking side channel? Here you have a side channel. Anybody can guess the code? I can tell you. It's most likely 1973. Because that's probably the year on which they installed that fucking K-pad. So a side channel basically can come in various flavors. You are probably familiar with time inside channels. You probably know about energy consumption side channels electromagnetic emissions, like you can probably try to check if you have some kind of antenna sending out some data. Behavior after fault, that's uh, what fault analysis is about. Have you ever heard about optical side channels? Have you ever heard about acoustic emission side channels? Because this last one is incredible, like you actually can go and check how much energy the processor is checking just by seeing how fast the fan is spinning. So let's talk a bit about why side channels are there. Well, it's because we see different behavior on the same black box when we put different inputs. And that gives us a hint about what the black box is doing or the, or the inputs we see. How can we de detect them when we are working with hardware? Well, timing simulations can help because they can tell you whether your hardware is working faster or slower, depending on what you are putting in. Power consumption simulations can help you detect power, uh, power side channels. Placement analysis can help you see, for example, if you have antennas or any kind of uh, constructs that will help you get some electromagnetic emissions out. And you can always do simulations under, under faulty conditions to see whether your hardware actually behaves the way you expect or not. How can we fight them? Well, here I'm going to tell you some advice from the cryptographic and software world that hopefully can inspire you. If you have to do two things, do both things and then choose one of the results. And don't optimize that, because otherwise your, your system will behave differently depending on which one you are going to choose. Introduce noise. Noise will make, makes my life as a pen tester incredibly hard. Make sure that you isolate devices, because if you don't isolate devices, you get electromagnetic emissions. And finally, if you see anything behaving weirdly, reset the whole thing or delay the whole data. So that's about it. And I'm not sure how much time I have, but I hope I manage to do it in time. Thank you. So, next one is Peter. Oh, you forgot your beer. Francisco? Yep. 
So I'm here to try and convince you that defining your data structures in Python and using the media is a fantastic idea. Um, so I'm from Vipercore. We use Python in an awful lot of our stuff. I was talking about Forestera earlier. This is what we use behind Forestera to talk to our design. So we describe uh, our data structures, our constants, our enums, our structs, our unions, all inside Python in a form that then gets digested a bit like a data class and we can read back and interrogate. Uh, we have a native translator that then goes to System Verilog and we have the capability to go to C, to C++, to any other language you particularly like. Things that we can do, we can perform really, really early consistency checks on this. So I've been an idiot here and I've gone, you know what, I'm going to create a union of something that's 64 bits wide and something that's 65 bits wide. And then it goes, by the way, that's a really bad idea. And it's done this really early in my flow. It's done it far before it's kicked off the system Verilog compiler. It's, it's, it's flagged it immediately up to me. The stack trace is a little bit of a problem because it's showing you the insides of the tool, but, for, but ignore that, we're moving on. So what else can you do with it? It works fantastically with CocoTB. You can unpack any structure and then you can access it as if it's like a struct. Um, until CocoTB2 that this was a problem with commercial simulators because it would show you the inside of the struct and it would get very, very unhappy. But it works great with CocoTB2, so, so thank you, whoever made that change. Um, you can describe an enums, you can describe structs, you can describe unions, you can do all sorts of things. We have clever sort of one-hot modes for enums, so you can automatically enumerate your enums in different ways. Um, you can use gray coding and all sorts of things. If you say gray code and you give it an odd number of elements or not a power of two elements, we go, no, nope, can't do that because uh, that's a bad idea. Uh, and you can even render it to SVG, so you can pipe them out nicely to your, uh, your um, documentation and render your structs, although you cannot see it here. Um, so yeah, so please, go and check this out. Uh, it's a Python library, you can find it on PyPy, you can find it on GitHub. Um, I would encourage you to use it and try it out. Yeah. Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, it's the first time I'm in, in this uh, conference, so I guess I'm a bit off topic here. I didn't really understand the exercise, so I'm, I'm happy to make a fool of myself in front of all of you. So, I'm just throwing an idea in the audience. Um, so, you may have seen my talk. So, I'm really lacking, you know, like uh, designs. And uh, designs of any size, design of any kind of characteristics. So, it's not just a new idea, it, it already exists, so I'm wondering, can we sort of create a tool that will generate netlists, netlist of any size, of any characteristics, of any... So the idea would be, okay, we, we, we have at least some kind of training sets that can be public today, like uh, public, but also it could be trained with internal data because it will be like, you know, private companies will be okay to, to train on their internal data. And then we will have a generator, so I don't know if we will use AI or wh whatever, to kind of generate any kind of data. For instance, for my purpose today, I'm, I want to generate a 10 million gates design, okay? It's not accessible, so... And I want to generate a netlist that is also makes sense, so it, it does not do anything, but at least if I do optimization in it, it will not completely disappear because it's not completely foolish. So it has some sense, but it has no purpose to, to, to summarize. So if people are interested by that kind of idea, yeah, please come to me. So um, yeah, that, that's basically all I have to say. So <laughs> I'll do better next year. All right, good. That was on topic. Hello, so this is, uh, we've done a case study. Uh, we took uh, three groups of students uh, at Technion, uh, gave them uh, two languages each uh, to uh, convert a baseline. So we had a Project F baseline and uh, each group of students had their own project <coughs> and they had their own languages to choose from. There was the first uh, group A, a DSL 
languages um, uh, composed of Amaranth, Chisel, and Spinal HDL, and they had uh, to choose from Group B uh, composed of Pipeline C, C, Lease, and Spade. And uh, there are uh, various conclusions that we currently have from, uh, they still haven't everyone uh, finished their project, but we can talk about uh, some important things. Uh, today, the, during the talk, I talked about the ABCs of hardware, des hardware language design. Uh, I didn't talk about the D part, documentation, 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 and the E, even more documentation. Um, this is highly important. Mea culpa, in DFHDL, there is no docu enough documentation. Um, if you're considering either adding another feature or adding documentation, do documentation. And uh, that's for, true for all tools, but importantly for this. Simplify onboarding as much as possible. I can say, again, not enough group of students to determine explicitly, but I think Spinal HDL won in terms of the easiest onboarding. So uh, kudos. Uh, Multi-platform is important. Some students use Mac, some students use Windows, some students Linux. If you out the bat, uh, limit them, you limit uh, adoption of hardware, and we want more people in this conference. Uh, open source is key, so we are, oh, we are able to do this with Project F, very low either of code, so it's important. Um, there are conclusions about uh, having earlier compiler warnings, it's important. Uh, there was an Amaranth issue that also uh, they found and, uh, and also got uh, uh, already discovered that it was later fi fixed. Uh, regarding Silis, it's interesting in case because they compiled first done uh, Silis, uh, Spinal HDL, then move on to Silis. Silis has kind of a new way to describe uh, FSMs, and the innovative concept of uh, Silis uh, made uh, make you write like you write a program, and then you cannot stay in the same state. So it was kind of weird. Uh, very late plus SDL is uh, a given. And the question is, can this be done by machine learning and not students? Thank you. Hi, so I'm Piotr. I'm part of CoreForge team at University of Wrocław. And I thought you may be interested in projects we are doing for three years now, uh, CoreBlocks. And uh, Coreblox is an open source, out of order core generator. The out of order processors are fairly complex. There are not a lot of them, especially in Europe. Uh, it is also written in Amart language. Currently, it supports RISC 532 uh, with multiplication, uh, compressed instructions, and binary operation extensions. Machine mode only, uh, unfortunately, for now. Uh, uh, and it is created to be very flexible, modular, and easy to experiment with and understand the code. So one of the great features of it, because it's a generator, of course, you can parameterize it. But the parameterization, I think it's one of the most parameterizable cores uh, available, because you can go really to low level, even connecting individual functional units in the core to reservation stations with different sizes. and. Uh, it is written in Amaranth, so this is uh, Python code, uh, and every configuration is in a single data class here. Um, another thing that we created now about the blocks in the core, uh, you know core blocks, the naming. <laughs> uh, so uh, we created transaction library, which is uh, for Amaranth, which is a blue spec inspired transactional system. Uh, uh, we plan to release it at a separate Python package soon. Uh, I would recommend using that, it is great. And this way we were able to separate uh, individual blocks of the core with cleanly uh, defined interfaces. Uh, all of the blocks are individually unit tested and this way we can easily just uh, experiment with different uh, implementations of uh, some blocks and uh, and also, for example, if you have a critical path somewhere, you can just, in just two lines of code, insert FIFO in there and break the combinational path. So that's great for experimentation and doing research. I wanted to show you a full transactional graph of the core, but, well, not today. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and the best part of the project is that it works. You can use it with uh, LaTeX to see the classic, absolute classic uh, donut, uh, spinning donut uh, demonstration. It passes risk five architectural tests. Uh, and uh, currently, this is still a work in progress uh, project. Uh, first goal was to create any usable risk five processor with out of order structure, so it was simple. And the next stage is to slowly iterate and improve uh, components to more complex and more performance <laughs> implementations. Thank you. Heather, I'm going to talk about the IPXX standard. Uh, so IPXX is a standard to describe metadata of uh, IP cores. It's an IEEE standard governed by Accelera. Uh, this is one way to view it. This is what Accelera themselves say about it. And I actually wrote an uh, article about IPXX in 2016. You can read my blog. Um, yeah, it has some issues. So what is it? It has basically three parts. You have the component, which uh, describes an IP core, uh, which files it contains, registers, interface stuff. You have the design to bind everything together and the design configuration to parameterize your design. Uh, and it's, written, it's an XML standard. Uh, and now people go, boo, 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 XML. Uh, but actually, you know, you're not supposed to use read XML directly. No human should. Uh, so what I did is that I created a Python library called IPyExec. This logo is slightly inspired by the IPXact official logo. I hope Accelera don't mind. Uh, so you now you can do this stuff in Python, and then you can create a lot of utilities uh, for like extracting registers and, and building top-level Verilog and stuff. So uh, is this used anywhere? Well, <laughs> actually, yes. Of all, out of all my projects, this is the one. This little stupid project is the one that has been picked up by the A vendor. So this is actually in Lattice propel tool nowadays. And I don't know how much time I've left. Oh, yeah, one, one and a half minute. <laughs> well, here's the fucking inverter. <laughs> Setting up. Uh, can you take? <laughs> Jules, Jules, can you take it? So Rob has a demo. While Rob sets up, let me just thank the sponsors. They made it a free event, which is very important for everyone. I think that we can have a couple of beers, good food, and everything. We have, yeah. It's very important to have sponsors, so if your company wants to sponsor next year, it would be great. Thanks a lot to Ed Michael, that, uh, uh, our headline sponsor today, and of course all the other sponsors. Thank you very much. That's very important to say. So, um, I mean, there's many, many thanks. So we'll do a thanks after Rob's done as well. Maybe? Yeah. Look. Uh, this display is not appearing. It's, it's still working on the setup. It's still All right, so. So every year we have a local host, and this year the host was Olaf by default. Olaf, yeah. get up. Yeah. This wouldn't have happened without Olaf. He's done more or less everything, including, the, including finding this beautiful cave we could all hang out in this evening. Um, <laughs> he's done very well. Um, so thank you, Olaf. It was a huge, huge effort on your behalf. Um, and of course, many, many thanks to all the presenters all the attendees, all the sponsors, all the people who bought professional tickets and made donations. Um, that's what enables us to pay for tonight and fill the fridge full of beer. Um, and we love putting this event on for you. You know, it's a bit stressful during the event and lead up to it, but uh, we actually love doing it. And we do it here and in the US every year, so come join us at every opportunity you have. Okay, are you ready to start? Yes, all right, and go. Okay, so this is another AMRAM thing. Um, this, is, this is a chip that we taped out in Global, Th Global Foundry's 130, proprietary PDK. We taped that out last in March, March this year. 
I was still waiting for it to come back, but I thought I'd lead you through it a bit. So this little sock that is has you know a motor driver, some I squared C, SPI, UART. I'll just scroll through this bit so that you can see the kind of here we are adding all the interfaces. We're using all the latest and as part of this, we've been developing all the extra features in Amaranth, such so streams, interfaces that allow you to kind of assemble this really quickly. Um, and if I just go down, you can see we've got Arbiter, we've got a software generator, our CPU is a CV32 E40P, there's some debug, JTAG, SPI flash, you know, pretty, pretty standard stuff, right? Uh, and then what I can do then is I can actually go to our debugger that we're going to be releasing as open source. So this is a, uh, a, a, a VS Code plugin. Um, so this gives you full visibility of every wire in the design. Um, so you know, if I can make a little bit of space here so we can see here, we've got the CPU, we've got the iBus in there, the DBus in there, the GPI, all the various components. We can dive, dive right in on any of these and look at any, any particular wire. We can, for any of these variables, we can click on it and find the source that where that came from, and uh, we can add it to a waveform viewer and uh, and track those. And you know, we can say we want to run the design. Need more hands for this. Is that right? RTL. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, RTL debugger. So we can, uh, you know, uh, we can. to a time tag. So I, I actually did a, a 10 millisecond sample here. And uh, just to show you, oh, something's crashed. Oh, well, it's a demo. Um, to kind of show you how fast it is. So this is the source repository. So if I want to build the simulator and run it, like we've got a little sim check that we run in the, um, and I'll show you around the, the GitHub kind of environment, you know, the, the, uh, the CI side, but we can write, make sim check. Okay. <laughs> so while, yeah, there we, how many minutes again? Yeah, there we go. Well, very, very quickly then, this is then it building uh, an actual an actual die. So in the place and route. So we go to the project, going GF130 design. You look at this, we can view this. And here we go, this is like, oh, oh shit. <laughs> there we go. That's the shit that gets taped out. Thank you very much.